Ah, the rural rustic sage, the standard character in every small town from Bangor, Maine to Soda City, California. James Thurber hates his guts. I'm reading tonight from Thurber Country, originally printed in 1949, at the time when the author really was living in the wilds of Connecticut, where one of these local yokels really, really ticked him off. Never get into a war of words with an author, as Mr. Thurber reminds us in A Friend of the Earth by James Thurber. When my mother was in Ludlow, Connecticut, on one of her visits ten years ago, she took a fancy to Zeph Leggin. Practically everybody did, except old Miss Eldon and me. And he gave her a picture of himself. People were always taking pictures of Zeph in one or another of his favorite and locally famous poses. Playing his harmonica, whittling, drowsing in a chair against the wall of his shed, eating a hard-boiled egg. The most celebrated of the egg studies shows him on his 36th day, or his 36th rather, the day he ate three dozen at a sitting on a bet. Zeph Legan was a character in the classic mold, a lazy rustic philosopher whose comic criticism of the futility of action and accomplishment made up, I was told, for his inability to complete a task, his failure to show up on time, or sometimes even at all, his genius at waggish confusion, and his light regard for the convenience of others. Wait till you meet Zeph Lagan, an ecstatic neighbor said to me just after I came to Ludlow. He'll drive you nuts, the old rascal, but you'll love him. We all do, except Miss Eldon. We always hire him for odd jobs. Used to be a master carpenter, they say, but now he doesn't give a good goddamn. Funniest guy you ever heard talk, though. Lost my wife ten years ago, he'll say to you. Play it straight, say, that's too bad. Yep, he'll tell you, lost her in a dry goods store, slipped out the back door. Ha 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 ha! For such bewildered foreign eyes as may fall upon these lines, I should perhaps explain that ours is a good-natured commonwealth of straight men and stooges, willing and eager to let a wall crumble or a roof sag or a pipe freeze. If the vandal responsible for the trouble has a Will Rogers grin, a soft drawl, and a dry way of saying things, there must be something grave the matter with me. From the moment I set eyes on Ephraim J. Zeph Legan, I wanted to poke him in the nose. For the sake of a fair record, I must report that Zeph took an instant dislike to me, too. Zeph was a sittin' in front of his shack and a playin' his mouth organ. He called it Ole Maria, I heard later. When Paul Morton, the neighbor I quoted earlier, led me up to him one afternoon, I was presented to Zeph Leg, and it was regarded as an honor, I had been told, if he stopped playing, opened his eyes, and deigned to speak. Zeph, I wanted you to meet Mr. Thurber, said Paul. Zeph kept right on playing. He's come to Ludlow to live, a new neighbor of ours, Paul went on. Zeph finished another bar of Nellie Gray and looked up at Paul, not at me. He a married man, he asked. That nettled me. He hadn't acknowledged the introduction by so much as a nod, and he didn't like the practiced twinkle in his eye. I could see what was coming, and I beat him to the punch. It was small of me, I suppose, but I offer the purely human excuse that we had come to dislike each other in the first few seconds. I lost my wife ten years ago, I heard myself saying in a strained, chill tone. The twinkle in Zeph's eyes died, and a hard look took its place. With our rapiers crossed and clashing, we searched for each other's gullet. He was shrewd, all right, and not slow of mind. He knew that I must have been tipped off to his opening gambit. He threw a quick, baleful glance at Paul, who he must have figured was the tattletale. Lost her in a dry goods store, eh? Zeph asked me, and the devil took hold of my tongue. She died, I said coldly, and it almost brought Zeph up out of his tilted chair. Then he saw the astonished look that Paul gave me, and he knew I was trying to knock his foil from his hand by an inexcusable trick. Now nah, that's too bad, bub, he said nastily. Come on, Jim, let's go, said Paul. I want to show you my studio. But Zeph and I were glaring at each other. Yes, she died laughing, I said, at a backwoods Voltaire. Come on, Jim, for God's sake, said Paul, taking me by the arm. Zeph closed his eyes, leaned back, and began to play Nellie Gray again on his harmonica. The bargain of our enmity was sealed. The only thing Miss Eldon and I had in common, I found out later, was our lonely immunity to the magic spell of Zeph Legan, 
And since she was a hard and hollow old lady, there were dark moments when I felt I must belong to the wrong school of thought in the case of the Ludlow minstrel. Miss Eldon had not spoken to Zeph or allowed him on her premises since the day of the great insult, May 16, 1934. She kept all dates, important and otherwise, neatly arranged in the back of her mind, along with her fine collection of old platitudes. On the day in question, she had summoned Zeph to her house, or rather she had summoned him a week before and he'd finally shown up on the 16th. She told him that her problem was beetles in the pantry. Zeph had a considerable reputation as an exterminator. He would never tell what it was that he used, except to say that the secret formula had been given to his great-grandmother by a sick Indian she had nursed back to health. Hey, beetles in your pantry, ma'am, said Zeph. These cockroaches. Miss Eldon's nose expressed disgust at the man's frank vulgarity. Well, whatever they are, she said, they're as big as mice. She had asked for it, and she walked right into it. Zeph's eyes twinkled, and he put on his Sunday draw. The only way to get rid of cockroaches big as mice, ma'am, he said, is to stop drinking. She ordered him out of the house, and he shambled away playing Polly Wally Doodle on his harmonica. The man is gross, she told me. I had some difficulty maintaining an expression of grave disapproval of the gross man, but I managed it. Part One of A Friend of the Earth by James Thurber. That's November 12th, 10 days since Republicans took control of the House. Mr. Boehner, where are the jobs? I'm Keith Olbermann, good night and good luck. And now with more on Mitch McConnell's country first request to President Bush in 2006 that he pull troops out of Iraq to help the GOP with the midterm elections. Ladies and gentlemen, having not caught John Stewart's intestinal flu <laughs> nor his case of the ponders, here is Rachel Maddow. Good evening, Rachel. The ponders? Yes, you know, pondering, <laughs> ponderousness, ponds, pond. Yeah, I think pond is the word I'm looking for. I think of myself as a proud ponderer, so if you don't see me that way, I'd like to pers I'd like to sort of keep that. You we know, can talk about it slowly over the course of an hour, perhaps. <laughs> a lot of leaning backward, lean forward during those interviews is what I always say. Okay, okay, point taken, my okay. friend. Point taken. Have Thank a good weekend, you, sweets. <laughs> you too. And thanks to you at home for staying with us for the next hour.